What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Omnic Lab. This episode 157. I'm back. Andres is back. ATL weekend is over. Baptiste has been covered. It's been a long time for Andres and I getting together, but for you guys on the podcast feed, it's been only about a week. So welcome back to the Strategy Overwatch podcast. We are returning this week to be a little bit more of a softer schedule to kind of ease Andres back into the thing that is talking about Overwatch that isn't Overwatch League, which is quite nice for him. <laughs> um, he's coming back from the ATL homestead, and we'll probably be getting into that here in a minute. Um, but my name's Rob, that's Andres, where we do we talk about Overwatch and nerd out a little bit and sometimes argue about it, which is <laughs> usually in the Discord <laughs> on game <laughs> nights. But um, yeah, welcome, welcome back, Andres. Good to see you again, man. It's been a while. Uh, it's, it's good to be back. Yeah, definitely. This weekend was super crazy. Everyone coming into town and Overwatch League being over here. Uh, definitely a lot of stories for a while made that weekend. Uh, I I thoroughly enjoy myself, but I will say I am glad to be back to the routine. Uh, it was a little bit too all over the place, just like a weekend of nonstop games and meeting people and just cool stuff happening happening. Um, that being said, there's a lot of to talk about Overwatch in general. I think that there's a lot of rumors and exciting excitement going around about changes that might be happening to the game. And at this point, after talking to a lot of the players in the league, after talking to a lot of coaches and other fans, it's very apparent that these changes are coming. And by changes, we mean uh, two to two roll lock which people have been talking about for a while now, but I think it's finally time to address it. Um, and after all the info we got, I think we got a good perspective on what's to come. Absolutely. And on my end, I've been basically preparing for a big move. I've got, um, I actually had a big like meeting with my new board of education, my new boss, some of the teachers I'll be teaching with got new schools my wife and i are prepping to move in the house it's it's crazy it's crazy and then today was my birthday i found out like this last week my brother got engaged and it's just Woo! been one thing after another like good news after good news and crazy news after crazy news it's a jam-packed month and then i got the biggest highlight of all coming up which is changing my isp and moving to the new <laughs> home yay <laughs> so hopefully the internet connection will actually improve uh, i know the new apartment we've actually got a chance to go check it out we're excited to move but we have some complications waiting for the guy to leave um that we're basically taking his place his flat before he leaves for a new flat that's always fun um, but luckily there's some things in place that'll help us out there. So let's break down a couple of announcements and then we'll, let's get into this topic and let Andres talk a little bit about his experience with the ATL homestead, maybe some future of esports here, and then we can keep moving. So, um, the first thing and the, always the first thing in our announcements is the game night. We had the June game night. We didn't really get a chance to talk a whole lot about it because we had ML seven on right before it happened and then, um, released the, the, uh, the podcast, episode around the time that we had it so basically this this last uh, game night was quite fun for a lot of us um it was really really packed despite it being on a really big highlight weekend for overwatch and overwatch esports but it was good nonetheless people giving crap about each other's overwatch league teams and uh it was it was just a lot of fun to be honest so if you guys want to make it out this month, it's in July on the 26th, which is the last Friday of this current month. As per usual, that's when we're going to be having it. And Andres is going to talk a little bit about coaching. Yes, coaching. Uh, and absolutely make it to game night. I had a ton of fun last time. We played a lot of custom games and like workshop games at the beginning to kind of warm up. And then we get, got into the competitive games. So if you guys have your own codes of games that you've been playing or certain customizations of modes that you've done, 
make sure to bring them and absolutely send them to me. I'm trying to collect as many of them, especially the fun ones, as I can get. That being said, coaching this month has been kind of put a little bit into a hold, at least in the beginning of the month, just because of all the craziness that's been the Atlanta Homestead games. But we're back at it. If you guys are a Patreon at the $2.50 tier or the Platinum tier, make sure you reach out to us this month so we can schedule something. I was already in touch with a bunch of you, and I think we have a few coaching sessions lined up for this week. So just let Rob or I know. And if you guys haven't signed up for these, these are having going really good. I've been really enjoying them. I think that the people who've been in coach have been really enjoying them. Um, it's been pretty dynamic if you're on console or you are on PC, if you have a excellent rig or not so good of a rig, we can work around that, especially now with the replay system, uh, we can do VODs or we can just watch you play live through a discord screen share. We get a lot of questions about how to do this. We're very flexible with it. Uh, we usually prefer to do it through Discord, but we can work around other methods if you don't have the best um, setup to do it this way. And and that being said, um, in general, it's pretty fun and very easy. And so far, I don't think that there's been a session we couldn't have done or some someone didn't get something out of it. Uh, we've been right. learning a lot too from you guys. Is it's really cool watching you. And I feel like every coaching session that I do, I get a little bit better at maybe pinpointing some problem areas and stuff. So I've been improving as a coach as well. So that's all I want to say. Make sure you sign up and reach out to us this month. Discord is the best place to do it. Make sure you have Platinum Level on, on Patreon and you have your email ready to share with us so that we can confirm that you are indeed a patron. That being said, let's get into sponsors. Omnic Lab is presented in large part by Top Score Solutions, an esports oriented community for business education, analytics, and other things like that. If you want to develop businesses, services, orgs, or creating content in the topic of esports itself, they're here to help. They have a flagship podcast as well about esports and business. Uh, you can check that out on Podbean and iTunes with the tag not Top Score Solutions. Um, you can also check out their Discord community on their website. They have a link, uh, toscarsolutions.com. In case you've missed it, they have brief new sport esports updates as well. If there are questions you can ask me and Andres to direct you to Ben or I Need Peeling is in our Discord in the Diamond Sponsorship tab. You can find him under that role. And be sure to check it out. We also have our good friend Switch, which we'll be checking in with this month uh, to see how he's doing soon. Um, on the next project for Omnic Meta. I would imagine that that website is going to probably break and be repaired and break again when the roll lock rolls in. And uh, we'll probably have some really, really cool new changes on that um, with regards to the roll lock when he gets to that and the new system has been integrated. So keep on the lookout for that. Andres, let's break out a little bit of our announcements and go into the Atlanta homestead. Talk about your kind of your first impressions here. I know that there has been homesteads in other areas. We had the one in Texas already, and we had kind of a little bit of a preview um, with the finals in New York City. So what what can we expect um, maybe in your first time? What were your expectations versus reality? And uh, why am I still ML7 on the stream? Questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> you, maybe your Anna has. I, just I'll got take it the that compliment. Good. Let's be honest. I'll be ML7. It's fine. I just I not you. just don't expect that kind of level of gameplay in your Boom. games. Ta-da! Just like that. Okay. You're back to rub. <laughs> All right. Um, great. No, but the the homestand games. And by the way, <clears throat> I realize it's actually homestand games, except that everybody gets autocorrected to homestead and i think that even like the blizzard account they got auto corrected to do that so that's why there's so much confusion because i was calling it the homestead too but it's homestead games apparently that's the official okay. um <clears throat> that being said it was a great success i was so impressed by it i think the event was really well put together um i was expecting something that was really good already just because from dallas from New York, we've already seen that it's possible to have a fantastic event, and they've delivered so far. Um, and th in this case, it was just the same super well put together event. Uh, the Cox Media Group, which was the people putting together the whole thing over here, did a fantastic okay. job. Paul, the owner of the team, was super generous. 
He um, did a lot of fantastic events. I think that it was really well planned. The venue worked out really good. I was glad that it was in, in downtown Atlanta because that's just a mess. And finding parking is terrible, super expensive. Yeah. Um, where they did it was just in the outskirts, was where it's not far enough, where it's hard to get to the city. Convenient. Yeah, exactly. But there's free parking everywhere. Um, they had a huge parking deck right next to the venue, and it was in a really open area. So it worked out really well. And overall, the crowd was just amazing. I mean, all the players will tell you. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a video of it coming out soon, too, because we, we managed to get a lot of interviews with them. But all of them agreed that <clears throat> playing in the homestand games and playing outside of L.A. is a completely different beast. The crowd, the roars, the cheering, like the energy that people bring, it, it's on a whole new level. Um, and Atlanta could feel it. Like they were playing out of their minds. The confidence was through the roof. I think that Baby Bay, he was like in his element, like he was feeling himself. He was popping off on Widow and Hanzo and some of the other heroes. Um, the whole team was just super resilient. And even when other teams were it seemed like they were going to take the advantage, Atlanta would just brought it right back because the crowd would just like every play that they would make, they would get cheered and like hailed. And then every time the other team would make a play, it would either be like complete silence or some chant of disapproval or something. So I'm sure. Now, that what was the arena that they, they did this in? Do you remember the name of it? It's called the Cobb Energy Center. And it's more of a performance arts theater than an arena. Um, yeah, I noticed the style was much different than what I was expecting when I saw some clips from the event, the venue. It looked like almost like an indoor like opera house or like a concert yeah, hall. Yeah, I think it's more suited for like theater or maybe comedy mm -hmm. or maybe um, some sort of like orchestra, orchestra or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of, I think, what it's originally intended for, but it actually worked really well for the venue. Um, and the sound. It seems like it would. The verticality of the seats would probably lend itself very well. Yeah, to that kind it, of an it was great for spectating, except for the people who are right in front, because obviously you have to be looking at the screens to see what is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the screen was super high up. So they actually put like little TVs like right in front of them so they could oh, okay. look at the game. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't. Up front wasn't probably like the best experience, but you could see a stage really close. And when the players would walk up and they did all the cool little events and the casters would come out, you'd be like right there with them. So that part of yeah. was cool. But yeah, in general, the spectating experience was very easy. It was really nice. The acoustics were good. The crowd was so loud, though, that sometimes they would just drown out the all of the casters and all of it, though. But I mean... That's I'm, the not, I'm not right? going to complain about that. Yeah, that was kind of the fun part. I mean, for some, from someone that le legitimately gets tilted by casting, I like generally mute the VODs most of the time. Um, <laughs> I don't mind that at all. So that's just me. <laughs> I would rather talk with my friends in the arena about like analysis like Andres and I did when we watched World Cup <laughs> and we had a couple Masters level players sitting next to us and we're like, oh, that was so bad. And then like everyone in the crowd super quiet. We're like, well... That's typical viewership, you know. <laughs> Sometimes that happens when you have higher tier players that are um, even just in simple rank games. They actually are, are able to catch more. Uh, it's something that it would be really interesting to kind of break down um, in the future. But transitioning out of this a little bit, uh, if we have time, maybe we can return to this topic because definitely would love to talk a little bit more about it. But that's not the the stuff you sign up for here with Omnic Lab. You sign up here for the strats. So we can get back to this if you want. Um, please let us know in the future if you want us to cover more like topics within Overwatch League. Uh, periodically, we've been we've been actually pretty careful with what we kind of curate from Overwatch League, just because of our recap kind of covers that it or scratches that itch for us. Um, and it's our Andres' sister show. Yeah, and but, now that you mentioned it, actually, if you guys want a more of an in-depth look at the Atlanta Homestead games, make sure to check out the Owl Recap YouTube channel because all of the interviews mm -hmm. are going up there. Right now, there's a really cool video about 222 Roadlock, which is very pertinent to what we're about to talk about. So yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the opinions were formed. A lot of the opinions we're going to talk about here today were formed um, by talking to the players and stuff. So make sure you guys check that out. Owl Recap YouTube channel. Um, that's where you'll find all of those. And there's more coming out too. Now, I won't pretend like everyone knows what we're talking about. I've done that in the past, and so I'm not going to do that again. But it, basically here, 
roll lock is something that we lock in rolls for specifically supports and tanks and damage. And you will have two heroes in each roll. And what this is saying is that basically for Overwatch League moving forward of season four is the current rumor and is relatively confirmed by quite a few leaks at this point. And also the ranked ladder system will be shifting to mirror that setup. Now, what does this mean is kind of something that we're going to get to much further down the line of this episode. But what we want to try to talk through is kind of pros and cons and what this looks like. And then what does that mean is comes later? Does that make sense? So that's kind of how we're going to structure our conversations here. Now, the pros and cons might get a little diluted together rather than separate, but we'll do our best to kind of highlight what we think is a good thing and a bad thing. And maybe something that just kind of hits that gray area nice and clean, if you yeah. will. Now, there's a few things I wish I mentioned before we go into the discussion. We don't know exactly how Rolock is going to look. We do have some speculations based on information that Jeff Kaplan has mentioned before. Um, he's been on interviews where he has admitted that Rolock has been something that they have toyed with before or they had people working on. He also alluded to the fact that it would be completely separate SRs, for example. So you'll be ranked as a tank, you'll be ranked as a healer, and you'll be ranked as a DPS player depending on what role you choose to um, queue up into rank mode, right? Um, mm. Which I personally think is a good separation. I think that one of the things that they've struggled the most in the past is the fact that it's really hard to balance the matchmaker for people because the skill sets are so different, right? Somebody might be amazing at Widowmaker, but not so good at Reinhardt, and the game that maybe you need a good Reinhardt and that person tries to fill in, you're playing it at a much lower level than you are playing your Widowmaker, right? Um, and what does the matchmaker do over there? How does, it, how does it decide, well, this is good, this is bad? It's just way too many variables. So separating those and being like, okay, this is the skill set that re is required for you to play tanks, there's a skill set required for you to play DPS and supports. And even in those areas, I think there's a lot of variance, right? Depending on which hero you pick, your styles are going to be a lot different. But I think that is the way to go moving forward. And I think that's kind of what we're going to assume Rolock is going mm. to be. Um, anything now, else you want to add about Rolock? Something I want to say on the outset here is that Andres and I are going to try to hit this as neutrally as we can. But please understand that Andres and I are very strongly in favor of this new system. And we'll probably get to our conclusions at the end. You'll probably see that bias kind of throughout. But we will do our best, especially I always try to do my best to present a devil's advocate or an alternate opinion on kind of how, how the cons are going to ruin the system. Or maybe not necessarily ruin the system, but make it not as favorable, if that makes sense. Because anytime a game system is created there's not going to be a perfect system so there's going to be some things in the system that aren't going to work as well or maybe they present themselves as a different mask for the same problem so for example andres's system lock of saying it's really good because someone you know maybe is a really good widowmaker but a really bad reinhardt or reverse somebody's very good reinhardt and very bad widowmaker in that system it makes sense because then they're categorically put into a tank role. But there's still this kind of soft, um, this soft lock rather than a hard lock, meaning that you're not going to have a separate SR for every single hero and no, solve that. That would be crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So even though you might be an excellent Widowmaker, maybe you're a really crappy Hanzo, or maybe you're a really good Reinhardt, but you're a really bad um, Wrecking Ball or a really bad Winston. So those solutions still have issues and they still even look in similar venues to hero differences but categorically they're putting you into a smaller area where you can succeed and where other people are not going to be competing against you for a specific slot in a in a game where there are i don't know i'm just going to pull a number out of the hat like eight supports you're only going to be fighting for the one out of those eight 
against one other player rather than all six of the players. And then also, in addition, in your rank games, you're not going to have as many people vying for those two roles where you get pushed off of the thing that you want to play in that moment. Yeah, so it's going to have a lot of effects. And just like you, like you right. said, um, it's going to be basically two people per role. You're just going to have to mm -hmm. you know, agree with one other person, like, hey, you played that, I played this. Because everything else in that pool is going to be yours, right? And your pool is yeah. going to be limited, right? You know exactly what you're getting from the beginning of the game. There's no deciding, um, okay, who, do we have a tank? Do we have a healer? Uh, maybe we should get enough tank. Maybe we should swap this guy over here. Um, you're going to have much less of that. Because at least you know that two people are going to go tank, two people are going to go DPS, two people are going to go healer. No arguing about that. Now, you at least have some realm of setup that you can understand and digest for what's yeah. going to happen. I think that composition wise, there might be some discussion there and you might still want to talk right. to your teammates what what you specifically want to go, but at least there'll be some semblance of consistency. Um <clears throat> also before we get too far into this, there's no official confirmation about Roloc. Blizzard has not said anything officially in their websites or anything of the like, but not only have we have several leaks from Overwatch League, from other news sources that are, you know, in talks with Blizzard or some of their employees or people that work closely with them. And let but, go. But <laughs> also know? the players, and don't get me wrong, none of the players, like, confirmed it, but the way that they talk about it and the way that I see some teams are starting to prepare and look forward into the future does speak to the fact that this is very likely to come um, and in the very near future, it was it was and with kinda, regular talks of them saying when this happens, uh, if this happens, you know yeah. that type of thing happening. It was very um, funny because you can you tell can, the teams are prepping. Yeah, you can tell that they've signed an NDA. You can't really say anything about it yet. So all the players yeah. were really careful, but some of them would you know have to catch themselves rather than say, <laughs> yeah, when Roloc comes, they would be like, oh no, sorry, if it comes. Mm -hmm. um, but you can mm -hmm. you can definitely tell that it's there and everyone's talking about it. Uh, everyone's preparing. Some of the meta in the league has is already evolving, and I think that some of the teams in the league are trying out that DPS and slightly different compositions because it it is time, right? And if you're I not a clinched playoff spot, you have no reason not to experiment. You know? Yeah, exactly. And now's the perfect time to do it. And with the changes looming in the horizon and everyone kind of like trying to keep it hush, but it's such a big change that it's too hard to keep it hush hush, right? Um, we'll yeah. see when they officially announce it, but for now, let's do some speculation. So with the speculation, uh, something that I wanted to like kind of help with the groundwork a bit is that there's a couple assumptions that people are making with this. Which is not only are we getting a new system in place, a la like separate SRs that has been confirmed, but there are a lot of unconfirmed stuff. Like Andres and I have kind of assumed that when you choose a role, you are then locked out of the others. There's no, you know, there's no system where you can hit a button in Hero Select and say, I want to swap with this person. You know what I mean? Like, okay, well, I'm okay oh, with like playing Hanzo this fight, game. Somebody will swap you their role mid game, or, or maybe even in the initial phase lock. Maybe there's something there because, like, in games like Heroes of the Storm or in League of Legends or even in Dota, they have a phase for picking heroes and banning heroes. But there's no picks and bans in Overwatch, so maybe there could be at the start of the game or at the start of a round, you would be willing to kind of hit the swap button with a friend. We don't know if that's a feature that they're instituting here. That would be interesting. But it could be it really be useful like or it could be really bad. Yeah, you like mid-game I mean? or something, they gave you the option to do swap with somebody just in case. Like, But that would I don't require know. both people mid-game to be dead and in spawn and wasting the clock. To no, that's that what I'm saying. So, you can't. You wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to do it like mid-game or, or not mid while well, the game is running, but like mid-match, mid right? Yeah, when the yeah. when the round is over and you're back into spawn and you have like those thirty seconds round, yeah. to kind of like get together again, like maybe you could right. do it then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that could be a po possibility, but we don't know because we don't have the system or the context in which that operates yet. So, an additional groundwork piece is that 
there is a large degree of separation with how this is going to operate for the general player base, you guys that are the general listeners and the players that are in Overwatch League. In Overwatch League, these are people vying for jobs and positions in teams and signing contracts that operate in the context of what hero pools they have. And so with Rollock, this allows them to specialize in the avenues of the Path to Pro series, if you will, getting and climbing in the ranked ladder, getting into an over open division team, applying there, playing there, having success there, going into contenders, and so on and so forth, getting all the way into Overwatch League. You have these, these threads, kind of, or these paths that kind of all converge into the Overwatch League, eventually resulting in getting a team. But this kind of role lock is kind of helping that system have a little bit of an easier time for players to be noticed and be found. And the funny thing is, it's not that much different than the intentions by which that they had in the first place, right? Like people are like, okay, who are we signing? We're signing Baby Bay to be a what? A damage dealing player. Does he play Zarya? Great. In this meta, it's really great because the roles aren't locked. Um, or, you know, people like Jake are playing Brigitte or so and so is playing Orisa, you know, stuff like that. So in this league, it's going to be people vying for contracts and positions versus roll lock for you and I, we're, we're vying for positions because that's what we like to play. And we want to enjoy playing that and maybe practicing on other stuff to increase our pool. If you yeah. Know. At most we get left out of the six stack. It's like, Oh, we need a healer. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Later, man. Later. Um, no, no, no. But now that you brought the league up, I want to interject my first con on Roloch okay. over here because honestly I hadn't thought about this. It was Sleepy from Washington Justice, former San Francisco Shock player, that brought this up and I think he has a good point. He mentioned the fact that players in the league, obviously DPS players are like pure DPS players are going to benefit from this change because now they have a guaranteed spot in the spotlight, right? They're going to get used. But he was saying players such as Sinatra, for example, which is an amazing flex player where his skills are he can play Zarya and he can play Tracer at a really high level. Those kind of players are going to diminish in value because now there's no point for them to be switching around. They're going to have to pick a role, right? Like, are you going to be yeah. tank or are you going to be You have DPS? to double down somewhere. Especially because, like you said, we don't know if they can even like swap roles mid game. If that's even going to be a possibility, or if we're just gonna be like, no, you you lock right. into your role and that's it. Kind of like in in MOBAs, right? In MOBAs nowadays, mm -hmm. you pick a hero and that's your hero for the game. There's no going back, no choosing. In Overwatch, there's still going to be a degree of flexibility, but we just don't know how much that degree of flexibility is going to be. So for the right. players who were extremely flexible who could play a little bit of everything really well i think that is going to affect them a little bit right and um i'm not an overwatch league player but i feel like the way i play overwatch is it very flexible in that, in that same sense. venue yeah. yeah i i like i love filling other roles i love getting creative in certain rounds i love exploiting different heroes to dif do different things um, I started playing a lot of damage dealers, but lately I've been finding myself more filling what the team needs. And even if I'm in the damage dealer role, sometimes I like pulling out a, Brig a Brigitte yeah, and playing her as damage or a Roadhog and playing him as damage just because of the skill set that they bring, right? Depending on the enemies playing, you can make your it job very so much, much easier. very much mirrors that style of play. Yeah, exactly. So... In that sense, I am going to take a loss there, right? Because my, that versatility that I've been training and building, and mm -hmm. building, yeah, that I've been like, that's my style, now is going to be a little bit more limited. And it's ha going to happen to some of the Overwatch League players too that are super flexible. Sure. Uh, and I, I don't, sure. don't want to compare myself to an Overwatch League player, not at all. Um, my flexibility is much more limited, but it's the way that I like playing the game. Um, and now it's going to be more of a one-track kind of thing right mm -hmm. yeah I, I tend to agree and th th I'll, I'll i'll weave in a pro and then i'll transition to another thing so the pro here is that inherently in the system where players are getting new assigned new um skill ratings or srs in the new system 
eventually that will normalize a bit and you can jump into a completely different skill tier of play no matter what you're playing. And so if you are really good at something and you want to train the other one, you do have to earn it in some in some in some realm. Whether earning it means I need to get to diamond level on these three different roles to be to feel good about myself, you know, to feel <laughs> like I've hit my bar. But for some people, it could be I want to get to gold on this one and I want to get to plat on this one and I want to go up one more on my best one to that one. You know, those those type of things can happen now. And it's not going to require people to have this really weird mindset that happens in Overwatch where at some point people start flaming you because your profile says something that you play and you are you don't have any hours on this. Or if you're a newer account, then they don't know what you normally play. So you hop onto a different role and you're like, well, I just play DPS in this account. It kind of nullifies the reasoning behind needing those type of things. You know that, what I mean? That is a huge pro, I think. The, so the I think that's, that's, that's that a pretty can, big win. Yeah, the fact that you can be like, I want to train my damage. And you can do that, right? You can queue up as damage mm -hmm. and you're guaranteed you're going to get damage. Even if, even if the other, maybe you wanted to pay, play McCree or something and the, the other person sure. plays McCree, they're still, you still go Ash, Widowmaker, um, you still got a, plenty of options, right? Soldier 76 that are kind of mm -hmm. in the similar vein. But what about other roles where maybe you're the Reinhardt player and you queue up with a, now you're guaranteed you're going to queue up with another tank. What if the other tank is also a Reinhardt player? I guess you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to have to be like, all right. I guess that's not the worst problem to have. Oh, look, we have two Reinhardt players. Well, it's kind of the same problem that we currently have, but it's a little bit more controlled. Yeah. I would say. Because, again, it, this goes back to our, our point about the soft cap, right? The soft uh, flexibility that you're asking of your players. The only problem is that the damage category is almost double as populous as the other two combined. And I do feel it's going to bring some stability to the games in the rank like rank wise just because it's going to cue you more appropriately at least i don't think it's going to be perfect just because if you queue up as dps it's not the same skill set to play hanzo as it is to play farah right so there's still going to be some degree of variability there where you would have to become good at all the damage heroes to play that flex role in there. So I guess there's still going to be that degree of flexibility, at least on um, the roles that have the most heroes. Hopefully as the game progresses and we get more tanks, more uh, supports, that will be the same in mm -hmm. all of the categories, right? Yeah. Now I'm going to institute another one, which is kind of a, a pro con, if you will. It's, it's that. A pro con. A pro con meaning that this is an expectation that I have, and if it doesn't happen with paired with Rolock, it's going to be a problem. And to our understanding, this is going to happen, which is a ginormous rebalance change that comes with it, because you have heroes in these two 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 setups of the game where previous design decisions, core hero identities have been formulated in the previous context in which the game operated which was you can choose whatever you want the only limitation is you can only have one of that in a game and you have a maximum of six total things that you can choose heroes to be sure so when you have heroes like uh, the one that always comes out in conversations is Brigitte but I think of other things like Zarya's and Roadhogs because there's not a whole lot of context where those heroes get a whole lot of play in a tank category and realistically fulfill that description. You know what I mean? Because And then at the same time, you have heroes like May and Torbjorn and, and Bastion where they fill a almost a specific type of damage rather than a general purpose of utility. And May even fills the role of utility, disruption, and tanking. Like, May is, like, real talk is actually kind of an off tank. And pretty much any hero that has over 200 hit points that goes into that 200 to 250 hit point realm can essentially 
become a pseudo tank. And then heroes in the tank category can kind of be a pseudo damage healer or stamp damage dealer um, that we've seen, like in fulfill the what we call a bruiser role, which has been a less durable, more damage version of a tank. And that's kind of the description of a bruiser or a brawler, if you will. So we have heroes like D.Va and and um, and Roadhog and even uh, you, you could even label Reaper in this category. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. That, that would be kind of what I would saying is a lot of heroes may lose a very big part of their identity, their play style, their balance, their usability even, and other heroes will come out to shine. So it's kind of a, a win-loss if this balance change comes to fruition where these players and heroes kind of lose their identity in a way because the new balance is now in a completely new context. Yeah, I, so I've been thinking about balance for a little bit here. And I think that some heroes will definitely have to be addressed. But the more I think about it, like this game, balancing for all possibilities, right? Like being able to play anything at any time, being able to swap is already a, a pretty big feat. And they got pretty close to having like almost every hero playable in the roster. So I think that it's going close. into a roll lock, we're not in bad shape. The only thing that does concern me a little bit is that lately... There's been a slow power creep on certain heroes that they've been adding slowly and slowly and slowly in order to combat goats. So they've been straying away from like that previous balance that they have to kind of like put down a composition that's been a little bit too oppressive for a while. And now we have heroes like Sombra, for example, or Orisa, which are doing incredibly well and going into... <clears throat> A two to two roll lock, they are, I think, overtuned a little bit. If you look at Orisa sure. right now, she is one of the best tanks in the game, and Bunker has become one of the best compositions in the game, only really dwarfed by Goats, for example. Um, so I think that some heroes might lose their identity, like you were saying, but it was it's more because they're gonna be forced out. By some of the more overtuned heroes, overtuned stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Like Diva, for example, she's in a very bad spot right now, where she was heavily nerfed because she was such a core part of Goats, uh, and Orisa was heavily overtuned to kind of try to stray them away from Goats and making Bunker very really powerful against it. Um, but now I think that going to this new meta, like Orisa. And Roadhog, for example, are going to be one of the tanks that are get played the most just because of how powerful that duo is right now. Much more than Reinhardt and Zarya are, which are two heroes that have lost a lot of versatility and a lot of utility based on all the nerves that, I, that have happened to GOATs. Even indirect nerves, right? Like Lucio, Speed Boost getting nerfed. That's an indirect nerf to, to Reinhardt and Zarya, which possess no verticality, um, and Reinhardt has no range, right? Like, he, you really need to close the gap with him, and usually charging in without your shield is a little bit too risky, so you just need that little speed boost to help you. Um, so, I don't Not know. Not to mention, there's nothing else in Overwatch that can grant other people's speed outside of Lucio. Yeah. That's now we it. have We also have McCree being an incredibly good, uh, going into 2-2-2 two, 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 Roadlock. He gains some popularity because now... You don't have all these tanks and all this incredible amount of people that can just mess with your day and you can't really do much about him. Now you're at least going to have a high response time now for yeah, threats. Yeah, exactly. So he's looking really good. I think that DPS that can insta-kill like Hanzo and Widowmaker are also looking really good going into the next meta because if you have to take two DPS, why not take the two DPS that can insta shoot you right away right wherever uh, wherever exactly uh double sniper is going to be big double sniper with like a race a hog um maybe even like a mercy and an anna your anna stays with your bunker the mercy goes with your snipers kind of thing um that's kind of what i see taking over a little bit when two to two roll lock comes in at least it, with the, it, the primary like what we would call the safe meta bet Meaning yeah. that this this seems the safest to kind of start as a as your your base plate. 
your foundation of starting and then the some, meta kind of developing from there. Some things are not going to be possible anymore, right? Like the Hammond triple DPS to healer, that's not going to be possible anymore. So one of the most... But this also comps... makes Tracer look way more appealing, right? Because of the nerf that she previously mm -hmm. had because of tanks being so prevalent. Now it, uh, apparently Tracer is okay. And also Dive starts looking a little bit more appealing too, right? When you don't have to mm -hmm. go up against goats guaranteed and... You can dive him. Genji's okay. Yeah, Genji's fine. Well, I don't know if he's in the best shape he's ever been. He's actually in a pretty bad shape right now. But with the changes coming, he might be looking okay again. It's it's mostly because it's so hard to get value right now with the heroes that get played. Especially if there's yeah. a Brigitte on the enemy team. Man, it's just really hard to get a kill sometimes with Genji. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just like so many different things that happen here. So let's let's see if we can think of other maybe cons with the system. So I remember reading something where people said that we don't have enough roles or enough heroes in all of the roles for this kind of a system to be taken in place and for this system to be taken and, taken and instituted in the game, there needs to be some harsher rule sets after you get more heroes similar to MOBAs where you get locked into that one hero and hero switching starts dying away as a possibility. There's also the other um, opinion of when roll lock gets instituted that hero bans should also be paired with it. And that's something that I hadn't really considered as a possibility. And Blizzard has not even had any leaks that have mentioned something like this in place either. So we don't know if these things are on the table. We don't know if these things are even considered in the back end, maybe coming later. And we also don't know what's coming yet um, currently. So yeah, that, that could be a huge con for some folks out there. For me, I don't think any of those things are a problem. And I, th I think those are a little bit more far away, right? I, I don't think yeah. they're toying with hero bands just yet, mainly because of the fact that you can swap in Overwatch. And even right. within Hero Rolock, you still have access to the entire roster as a team, right? Not not as a person exactly. now, but as a team, you still have access to the entire roster. So I think mm -hmm. that as long as you can swap heroes, bands just look a little bit less appealing because ideally you can fight whatever hero they have with your composition, right? Or with your changes. Um, and th I think that was the main problem and why 2-2-2 two -two -two Rolock is being instituted is because that philosophy... The, the fact that you can counter compositions just with your swaps was not holding true in the current meta, and especially at the highest level, with GOATs being the most prevalent comp. It was just not happening, right? There was nothing you could really swap to. And even the, the counters, Sombra, for example, um, rather than creating another comp that could counter it, it just got absorbed into GOATs. Now you just have Sombra GOATs. Um, so just too too much of a strong composition. I think that that was like the last straw that Blizzard was like, okay, I don't think we can kill this just by balance. This is a matter of too much liberty and too many good effects coming together to the point where we would just have to nerf one of these heroes to the ground, making it unusable to destroy this composition. And even then, I think that goats would still exist. They would just replace that part with another part and keep up the fact that you have huge health pools, amazing heals that never end, um, incredible defensive cooldowns that can keep you alive through some of the strongest abilities in the game and just un unbelievable sustain and even on maps where you shouldn't have sustain. Because I was going to say, <clears throat> maps are one of the other reasons why swapping is so important in this game. It's been designed so that <clears throat> different heroes have different strengths and their usability in each map goes up and down depending on where you are. But goats they didn't have that problem, right? You know, it's like, oh for a long time. You need us to do a high ground map, we'll just take the stairs as a group and lose your speed boost and then take high ground, then we'll come down and then we're good again. Um and just I don't know, not even maps with sub goats. And I think that's why eventually road like is so needed. Right, and it's a necessary evil. I think that is going to remove a lot of versatility from the game, but that versatility was getting dwarfed anyway by 
the heroes that were in the game anyway. Like, we were never going to yeah. get it back. It, it's kind of a weird position the game was put in. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair to Blizzard a little bit here, um, I don't think this is something that they wanted to wait this long to institute. And I feel like they have actually been working on this a lot longer than maybe the general public would give them credit for. This type of a system to institute in the Overwatch League is probably a glorified flip of a couple switches. But to put this to the general public and to have a system in place that balances games, that connects players against each other, and sets up separate systems for each role likely takes a long time to build to make sure it's not broken when it gets out there to make sure that it has some form of sustainability and that the ranking system recognizes when people are um, it, kind of like their anti-cheat or anti-smurfing thing where you basically can only smurf so many times until you get back up to where you belong, um, gaining a bunch of ranks very quickly and then sticking there, that, that type of a thing, or if you have decay, that's something that is is not something that you can just fix with volume of workers. You can just say, hey, we're going to hire like 100 more people in development and this is going to happen. Like the, the funny illustration I remember hearing from a game dev friend of mine was that you can't have a baby in under nine months by throwing more mothers at the problem like it doesn't work that <laughs> way <laughs> you still gotta wait nine months for this thing to come out <laughs> you can might maybe make it a little easier or a little um more comfortable for them but eventually it's not gonna it's blizzard it's not gonna come out until it's done okay so they're not gonna give you something that's half baked unless it was completely blindsided by something or some ddos kind of just jump jumped in front of everything you know so that's something I wanted to make sure that kind of pops out here. It's like, you got to give Blizzard a little bit of slack for it, the impatience of people that are really for this type of thing, including myself. Um, this is something that people, including the pros, have wanted for a really long time. And it sounded like it was going to come out last at the end of stage two. And then they probably hit some kind of developmental wall that this is just like, it's not ready yet, guys. No, 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 no. Next. It mixed the uh, I can't I can't speak pig Latin, but you get the the and inference here. <laughs> not only developmental, I think they also hid some resistance from league sure. investors and some other people. I think that, it, but it was too soon for a lot of people. Potentially, um, yeah, yeah. So we don't know ex the details there, but it, it it was postponed, and we still haven't heard anything about it. So they're either waiting for this stage to be over to finally announce things. They might have a big drop. We know that there's a new hero that's supposed to be announced pretty soon. So I wonder if we want to do this big drop where it's like, new hero and Rolock. Let's go, Overwatch. Um, can I get like this big hype moment there? They might be waiting for that. What do you think? I mean, to me, I feel like the Rolock and the the new hero package deal with a big chunk of balance changes to kind of kick things off and revitalize metas and set it up for, you know, realm four of overwatch league and then give the general public something this early feels super necessary right now. Cause like for me, the game has kind of hit a big stagnant point over the last couple months, including the last season, maybe last two seasons in particular. And then moving into this current season, I haven't even done placements yet. Um, and so I feel like this type of a change, including the new hero, the new system, maybe new balance changes, feels way more necessary for the general populace than for the pro circuit. But that being said, I feel like this hurts. The, the biggest negative is for the pro circuit to institute it this early because no one has had any chance of practice regime regimens. No one has had signing contracts, scouting, preparation you know like although, there's although, so many big negatives for that i will say all the teams are prepared for two to two in a way because they all signed into overwatch league thinking dps were, was going to be you know a big majority that's and fair. big reason of their sure. success so it's not like they're lacking dps players they they've certainly become less appealing and a lot of them have put been put in the bench especially the ones that couldn't adapt to zarya or brigitta 
But I think that a lot of the teams are are ready. And I think that you're seeing it <clears throat> in a slight change of meta that the league has been going through. Like, GOATS has been a lot less prominent in a big part because of Sombra. And a lot of teams have more been turning to their strengths and being like, okay, this is what we're good at. Let's just try it out. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. I think that the meta's already changing, which is kind of funny that as soon as 2 to 2 Roloc is getting implemented, then the meta is finally starting to shift. But um, such are things. But yeah. I mean, like the other thing that's really interesting to me is I actually had a conversation with one of my uh, guys that I was coaching today on my time, uh, maybe before you guys and in the morning for him because he was in the UK. But the... The interesting thing to me was that when I was playing on a separate account and I got it matched in bronze and in silver, I found that those players in particular are re- that that represents a pretty large portion of the population, probably about a third in those two tiers um, or more. Are pretty much like. Married to the concept of two supports, two healers and two damage dealers when they're looking for communicating with their team setting up the roster playing the game whether they play those here as well or not it doesn't really matter um it's it's just in that system and in that context they feel like that's necessary for whatever the reason is and then like as you get up and down people start muting and leaving chat and one tricking and just like i'm not i'm not going to talk with anybody i'm just going to play what i want to play and that kind of selfish mentality kind of gets pre way more prevalent the the more you play i i I would say um just because the more you play one hero the better you end up getting and the the more often you play it the more balance changes you kind of endure with it you kind of you know can hit some sort of critical mass and kind of level out somewhere um so i don't know if i'm really even saying anything on this uh kind of like dancing around the question maybe but i'm excited for it to be honest if if this is something that's coming because I'm I'm excited to basically have a pregame regimen where when I sit down for the game as a player, I know what I'm going to expect in my game. I may expect that the one hero of all of the damage dealers when I queue up for DPS might be taken. But if I have a plan A and a plan B, I'm going to get one of those two options. And that's really great for me. Because that means no one else is going to take that from you as a player. And losing agency is, like, I would even say double or triple as bad as having a plethora of options. You know what I mean? Like, having something taken from you feels way worse than having options in the first place. Yeah, I will say that even though we're losing some freedom, I think that sometimes limits kind of, like, breed creativity a little bit and allow for different strategies. And like you said, even though as players, we're going to have less heroes to choose from every game, I think that we might end up having more variety regardless. It's kind of like... still get more options to play. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like when we could play any amount of heroes in the game. You could play six Winstons if you wanted to. And eventually that evolved into two Winstons, two Tracers, two Lucios. And if you were not running that, you were just getting run over. And then when you want to stall over. six Divas. Yeah, and then six Divas, et cetera. And I think that changing that actually let open up the path for a lot of other compositions, a lot more organized Overwatch that highlighted a bunch of different heroes. Um, and I think this change is sort of in the same vein, where it's going to prevent certain really oppressive compositions and really out of hand effects that go together from getting out of hand. Um, and in, in the counterpart is going to allow players to play a lot more of a variety of things. Um, I do hope that some balance changes come with it because even though I think the majority of the roster is in pretty good shape to go into it, even heroes like Brigitte, I think are in pretty good shape to go into a two healer only meta you might not be able to play her with every combination of healers but she's still a really good healer that brings a lot to the table more than just you no know, raw heals like maybe 
Anna or she presents a backline threat where diving doesn't want to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, and a front line too, because she can contest and she's a pseudo tank as well. So I don't know. I think she's going she looks good going into a two to two roadlock. But I do think that it's more scary that heroes that are overtuned right now. And I think that those might end up being the oppressive ones. Um and hopefully we don't have just like a bunker dominated meta for a while because of those overtuned heroes. Hopefully Blizzard does address that it's going to require a slightly different balance and they might have have to revert or not revert, but at least look into some of the changes that they've done to try to nerf goats. Yeah. Now, Andres, have you played any like Dota or League of Legends or Heroes of the Storm in the past, right? You've played at least Heroes, Yeah, I, I I've played a few MOBAs. Okay. So, like, there was a video that... Monte Cristo had posted on one of the casters for Overwatch League, and he basically did something a while ago that was basically describing why he thought 222 or a roll lock system would be a, a great idea for the league, especially, and for the game as a whole. And kind of gave a little bit of a MOBA history lesson for you because what happened in the past was that, you know, some teams were playing all of these strategies in League of Legends where they would play, you know, two top laners and two bottom laners and then one laner in the middle and the single player in the center in a game where they snowball items and snowball abilities and kills and resource management of the map. They would basically make that the quote unquote carry role. And then in the bottom lane, they would have one of the, those two heroes get more of the experience than the other and and kind of get the gold in the resources to get items because they scaled really well with those. And then eventually the system became the meta was that the, the top laner that had two people in it would have one of those people that would just pick like kind of a big tanky bruiser type character that do, does a lot of like brawly damage well with another player, but had enough sustainability in the early mid and late game to kind of hit all of these little creatures in what they called the jungle or the central areas between the lanes and fight and contest those objectives. And so what Blizz what um Riot, the game company started doing was making this style of play a little bit more easy. They started instituting items in the game that would help you get more passive gain of gold so that you could allow another player in your lane to also get experience and get the gold instead of you having to get that gold. Same thing in the jungle. They they started allowing more more different hero rosters to not just fit into a bruiser role but be more of like a mage or be more of like a assassin. So they had these different styles inside of different roles and kind of broadened the roster by allowing everyone to do any of the different roles. And then eventually it basically became that the roles themselves, the jungle, the top, the mid, and the and the and the bot lane that support and the and the AD carry or the attack damage or auto attack damage characters started developing into heroes like damage and support and, and tanks and overwatch. So what Overwatch is kind of doing here is kind of trying to mirror something like that where you have a huge category and you can switch on a dime when you die you can switch and you only lose one resource and that's your ultimate and whatever charge you currently have but you can choose anything you want in that category and you're still going to sacrifice some of your resource similar to compositions in league of legends being locked out with a pick and a ban but in overwatch you get you get picked in and banned into a category and you're stuck but you can play whatever you want in that system. And you got two of them of each of them. So you have a, like, it's really weird to kind of deconstruct something that you already know really well. But this is kind of something that you can mirror within a MOBA context. Because Overwatch doesn't really fit anything. It's kind of like this weird amalgamation of a lot of different genres. So it's kind of hard for us to kind of anticipate, well, this is good for the game and this is bad for the game in different systems where... They've, they're kind of pioneers, you know what I mean? Like, this is a new a new ideal. Yeah, I think that overall, it, uh, it's a weird way to start a game, right? Like, here's all the freedom, right. and from then on, they've been kind of like, okay, that hasn't worked out, so let's put uh, the, <laughs> these limits. Yeah. Okay, that hasn't worked out, so let's put these limits over here. 
Um, but but in a way, I think it's been an interesting trial and error, right? Like mm. no other game has offered that much freedom before, at least in like the choosing and allowing players to kind of like strategize and be like whatever we want. Um, and it was almost like a social experiment there. <laughs> And now we've come to certain conclusions. It's like, okay, as a community, I don't think we can make this system work. Um, now we definitely need to try something else. And I think that Rollock might be an interesting avenue to take the game into. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. We'll see how it turns out to be. And I know that we're, this is mostly just speculation because nothing has been announced. But at this point, it just seems almost imminent that is going to happen so I, we thought it was a good time to bring it up hopefully you guys enjoyed yeah. this discussion um there's a lot to think about there's a lot of theory crafting that you can do you we can probably sit here all day and just talk about different for, for probably another couple hours <laughs> um but yeah let us know what you guys think of to to roll lock whether you like it or you don't i think that Regardless of your opinion, it's coming, so might as well brace for it and prepare. And I'll wrap up by saying that when this system, if the system ends up kind of rolling around, I'm really excited because I feel like this is going to kind of spark a new creativity within the development team. I feel like the development team is going to maybe be invigorated. I feel like Ladder's going to feel a little bit more invigorated. It's going to feel different. Just because something is different doesn't make it good, but it does make people interested to go try it. So yeah. I think that that is something that, that we can all look forward to, regardless if the system is good or bad. Um, so that being said, let's uh, let's thank a few people. Uh, we have our diamond sponsors, which are the people on patreon.com slash OmniClap that are supporting us at the highest level. Um, and they sponsor each and every show. And they are Top Score Solutions, of course, uh, Refire, Bunk Plays, Meow Shmeow, Shazir, of course, uh, Shepard, Crimson Fail, Roger B, Chris Deplea, Tragic Zach. And then we have some new patrons this week. We have David B. We have Cohen D, who has increased their pledge. We got Funk Star, which is a name that I recognize, so they must be returning. And we also have Keith. So thank you guys so much for changing pledges, adding pledges, or returning Patreon uh, patrons. We really, really appreciate it. And especially if you're upgrading just to get the coaching session, we really appreciate that because that means we can engage with you more and uh, that we can help you out in your gameplay. And we really, really love doing that for you. Um, I believe that on the last show, we had our last iTunes review. So we have currently none right now, but it is the second best way to support the show besides listening. You can listen is the number one thing that you can do for us. And the number two thing is leave us an iTunes review because that helps our search results in Google, search results in any um iTunes Avenue and iTunes is kind of like the big coup d'etat for podcasts. So it's just like the, the pinnacle for that. You can also leave us a review on Stitcher. If you have that, I'm not sure how we get those anymore, but we do appreciate that to help us in the search results. And, uh, we have Twitch affiliation. So if you want to catch us on live streams, it's a little wonky with our times. We don't really have a set schedule. We try to announce it when it happens. So definitely join the discord or join your uh, Twitter and, and ring the bell to get those notifications when we go live. Um, you can support us as the affiliate there um, for Amazon Prime as well and Twitch Prime. Andres, that's going to do it for our show. It's been quite a roll lock and an episode lock. So why don't you let the people know at home where they can find you and they can find the show? For sure. If you want to find me, you can do so over on Twitter at iPlayGames. You spell that I-P-L-A-A-I games. I've been tweeting a lot about the Atlanta homestand. I got some cool pictures in there if you guys want to catch that. And again, make sure you check out the Owl Recap YouTube channel because all of the content that we were able to gather is going to be appearing over there. Bob has been hard at work editing all this stuff. So make sure you check that out because it's really awesome content. And if you guys want to check out um, and talk with Bob directly or I'll recap or Overwatch League stuff with them or you want to talk about Omnic Lab 222 or any kind of Overwatch strategy, you can join our Discord and also our game nights at Omnic Lab's Discord link, which is in the show notes or discord.me slash Omnic Lab in your browser should get you there. You can find me on Twitter at the tag, not Rob. You can also find me on that on Instagram. And I think that's going to do it, guys. Don't be a lab rat, be a scientist. We'll see you next week. And... Uh, Hopefully we'll get some more news on new hero, a new event, or something else. See you then.